The purpose of this video is to look a little more closely at the phenomenon of confounding and to introduce a new idea which is called conditioning on a variable. And these ideas are really central to the uh, modeling process, so we really want to do a good job of looking at these ideas. Now let's just take a step back first. And this is what we've seen so far. And this is a representation of how the patterns that we see in data are related to our causal hypotheses about reality. And this top row up here, this is our view when we are looking at a continuous outcome. And this down here is our view when we are looking at a binary outcome. And these different views of the data, these different patterns that we see in the data relate to our three basic causal hypotheses down here. And if we don't see patterns in the data, which are represented by these, then we assume or we hypothesize that there in fact are none of these causal relationships existing in reality. Now, if any of this is unclear, you should go back and review the previous videos where we introduced these concepts. Now, one thing I want to say here, just as an aside, is that when we are looking at a continuous outcome, as in the top row, we've used a continuous exposure variable as well. And when we looked at a binary outcome in this bottom row here, we also used a binary exposure variable. Now, I don't want to give the impression that it has to be this way, that the, you know, the disease variable and the exposure variable either have to be continuous or they both have to be binary or categorical. That's not true. When you have a continuous disease variable, a continuous outcome, you can, in addition to having a continuous exposure, you can also have a binary exposure or a categorical exposure with three levels, that's allowed. And if likewise down here, if you have a binary outcome, you don't have to have a binary or even a categorical exposure, you can have a continuous exposure. Um, and so we've just used these because these are the uh, best ways to look at it when we want to just make these points that we were making about the connection between the patterns we see in data to our causal hypotheses. Now what we're going to be focusing on in this video is this confounding causal hypothesis down here, which is number three. We said that this is a classical representation of confounding, where you have some other variable, which is a cause of both your exposure and your disease variable. And we said that if we have this kind of causal structure between our variables, that this can lead us to see a pattern in the data between the exposure and the disease variable, to see an association between exposure and disease. Now, before we move into this, one of the things that we're going to do now is that we are going to make our diagrams start becoming a little bit more complex. We said before that these are the basic causal structures, but in fact, you can have combinations of these different causal structures happening at the same time. So, for example, we could have an uh, arrow between the exposure and the disease variable while we have confounding at the same time, which would look like this. So here we can see that we have exposure is a cause of disease, but there is something else in here which is also a cause of both the exposure and the disease. So we might have some causal effect here, but our estimate of that causal effect is going to be confounded by this other variable which is in there. Well, let's think about this using an example. So let's start a new idea here. What if I wanted to test if drinking coffee was a cause of COPD? And so I have an arrow from coffee to COPD. And I'm going to say that there is a confounding variable here, which is the tendency to use stimulants. And this tendency would lead individuals not only to drink more coffee, but it would also cause them to be more likely to smoke. And in turn, smoking would increase 
the risk of COPD. So here is what the structure would look like. Now there are a couple of things that I want to say about this diagram. Um, the first is that thinking about this uh, tendency to use stimulants and these two arrows, one going into coffee and one going into smoking. Now these arrows represent the same thing that this arrow up here from coffee to COPD represents. It represents a causal effect. So if you're thinking about this tendency to use stimulants and its cause on coffee, drinking, and smoking, then you would think about it in exactly the same way that we've used before. To think about the tendency to use stimulants if it's a cause of smoking, then you would think about the entire population that you're looking at. Here it's the uh, non-institutionalized U.S. population. And think about everybody if they are exposed. Remember exposure is indicated by the orange box around the circles. This, the orange box, the exposure here is tendency to use stimulants, right? And so here, everyone has a tendency to use stimulants, and here, nobody has a tendency to use stimulants. And so you have to think about, if everyone had this tendency, do you think that there would be more smoking in the population? Now we're talking about the risk of smoking rather than the risk of a disease. The risk of smoking in the population is higher if everyone has this tendency to use stimulants compared to if nobody has the tendency to use stimulants. And so I would say, yes, that's true. And so this is why I can say that I think I hypothesize that there is a causal arrow here. Same thing for coffee. If everyone has a tendency to use stimulants, then I think that the risk of using coffee, uh, we can talk about it in technical terms that way, is, um, is going to be higher than if nobody has a tendency to use stimulants. So you can use this idea when you are building up these causal diagrams and you can think to yourself, well, can I put arrows between different variables? For example, in this we would think, oh, is there an arrow between the tendency to use stimulants and coffee drinking and the tendency to use stimulants and smoking? You can just think to yourself, okay, if everybody in the population had this tendency, would the risk of coffee drinking or the risk of smoking be different than if nobody had that tendency? And if you think that that would be different, then you can go ahead and hypothesize a causal arrow between those variables. Now, another thing I want to point out here is that this causal diagram is already more complex than the one we have up here, right? So here we have this something else, which in this example is the tendency to use stimulants, and we have an arrow going directly into the disease and directly into the exposure. Well, on the exposure side, we're the same, but over here on the disease side, we have an, a variable in the middle. And so what we're seeing here is the a more realistic causal diagram, and quite often you will have these chains of variables. And we could make this chain of variables probably as long as we wanted, right? We could probably put another variable in between smoking and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Maybe it would be something at the, you know, the molecular level, what happens biologically to the lungs when you're exposed to tobacco smoke. We could put that in here, right? We could say that if everybody in the population was a smoker, then the risk of those kinds of biological effects in their lungs would be higher than if nobody in the population was a smoker. So we can build up these causal chains of relationships between variables. And part of the art of building these causal diagrams is just knowing how much detail you want to put into the diagram. And that just comes through practice and sort of seeing the practical applications of the diagram. But at this point, what's important is just to know that this is, we're beginning to see more realistic causal diagrams. Now, one thing I want you to notice here is that if we just look at these three variables, coffee, smoking, and the tendency to use stimulants, this has the structure of our basic diagram of confounding. If we go back here and look, this one right here, this has exactly the same structure as this one right here. And we said before that if we see a pattern in the data between coffee and smoking, right? For example, if the variables move together at the same time, then we can hypothesize one of three basic causal structures. One is that coffee drinking is causing smoking. Another is that smoking is causing coffee drinking. And the third is that some other variable is causing both coffee and smoking. 
Now, the relationship between the pattern that we see in the data and the causal structure goes both directions. In the same way, because now we're starting from this idea about the causal structure of reality, we have this idea that the tendency to use stimulants is going to cause both coffee drinking and smoking. We can then say that because of that causal structure, we expect to see a pattern in the data between coffee and smoking. If we look at these variables together, we're going to find that they're associated. For example, we might find that the odds or the percentage of coffee drinkers is going to be higher among those who smoke compared to those who don't smoke. And likewise, the percentage or odds of smoking is going to be higher among people who drink coffee than among those who don't drink coffee. And it's this association between coffee and smoking that is actually going to cause the confounding in this causal effect of coffee on COPD. Now, I think it's important for us to see this more clearly than perhaps is possible looking at this diagram. So I want to look at this phenomenon in a closer way using a different way to represent the data. So here I've represented the analysis in a different way, and we are primarily interested in whether the exposure of coffee has a causal effect on COPD. And so we can look at the association between coffee drinking and COPD by cutting our data into two parts, one part being those who drink coffee, and another part being those who don't drink coffee. And a line above the variable means not. So this line above drink coffee means don't drink coffee. And so then if we have it, our data in this way, we can look at the individuals and we can begin to see if they have the disease or not. So red here indicates that they have COPD and yellow indicates that they don't have COPD. And so we can calculate the odds of COPD among the coffee drinkers. That is 14. There are 14 people with COPD divided by the number of people who don't have COPD, 18, and we get a value of 0.78. And if we do that over here, the odds of COPD among those who don't drink coffee is calculated as 10 divided by 22, and the odds of COPD here is 0.45. And if we were to calculate the odds ratio, comparing coffee drinkers to non-coffee drinkers, then it would just be the odds over here, which is 0.78, divided by the odds over here, which is 0.45, and we get a value of 1.73. So the odds ratio here is 1.73, and we said that if the odds ratio is greater than 1, then we have an association between the variables. So we see here that coffee drinking and COPD are associated with each other, and then we could hypothesize one of our three causal relationships, either that coffee is causing COPD, that COPD is causing coffee, or that there is confounding. Well, in this situation, it looks like probably we have some confounding. How do we see it? Well, here we have smoking is indicated by a blue dot. So you see these blue dots among the individuals, and those are the smokers. Individuals without blue dots are non-smokers. And one of the things that we notice is that among the coffee drinkers, a higher percentage of them are smokers than among the non-coffee drinkers. This is the effect of the tendency to use stimulants in our causal diagram. We expected to see that coffee drinking and smoking were associated with each other, and we see that here. And so the problem here is that when we're looking at the association between coffee drinking and COPD, we see that there's a higher odds of COPD among those who drink coffee, but is that higher odds of COPD due to their coffee drinking, or is it due to the fact that there are more smokers over here? Well, how are we going to distinguish that? How do we know if... I mean, we can see the higher odds of COPD over here compared to over here, but you know, we can see that there is a higher percentage of smokers over here compared to here. And we, we, you know, we hypothesize that there's a causal relationship between smoking and COPD. Well, how are we going to distinguish whether this higher odds of COPD among the coffee drinkers is due to their coffee drinking and or due to their smoking? Well, the solution here is to first recognize what the problem is. What's the problem here? The problem here is that the, the percentage of smokers among the coffee drinkers is not balanced with the percentage of smokers among the non-coffee drinkers. 
there are more smokers over here than here. And so that's why we can't tell if the differences in COPD between the two groups might not be due to the smokers. You know, if we had, for example, 50% smokers on both sides, among 50% smokers among the coffee drinkers and 50% smokers among the non-coffee drinkers, we wouldn't have a problem anymore. If we saw any association between coffee drinking and COPD, if we saw more COPD among the coffee drinkers compared to the non-coffee drinkers, we, would, we, could, we could know that that difference is not due to the smoking because the smoking would be balanced on both sides. 50% smokers here, 50% smokers here. Any differences in COPD that we see between these two groups can't be due to smoking because it's balanced on both sides. And that's really the key here to how we solve this problem. And what we do is, is we actually recognize that if we split the problem into two parts, we can actually balance the number of smokers among the coffee drinkers compared to the non-coffee drinkers. For example, if we only look at those individuals who are non-smokers, now the smoking is balanced on both sides. There's exactly 0% smoking on both sides, coffee and non-coffee. And likewise, if we look only at the smokers, again, the smoking is balanced on both sides. It's exactly 100%. So any difference that we see in the COPD on the coffee drinking side compared to the not coffee drinking side cannot be due to smoking in this case, and it cannot be due to smoking in this case. So let's rearrange this problem, putting the smokers over on this side, and let's put the non-smokers on this side, and let's do this problem in two parts and see what happens. So now what we can see is that if we look over here on the smoking side, the odds of COPD in the coffee drinkers is three. It's calculated as nine divided by three. That's a number with COPD divided by the number who don't have COPD. And if you look at the non-coffee drinkers within the smoking group, their odds of COPD is also equal to three. It's three divided by one. When we calculate the odds ratio, we get an odds ratio of 1.0. So what we find is that Coffee drinking and COPD is actually not associated among the smokers. And if we come over here and we do the same thing, we get a similar kind of result in that the odds ratio is equal to one. So coffee drinking and COPD is also not associated in the non-smokers. Now, one of the things you notice here is that although the uh, comparing coffee drinkers to non-coffee drinkers, there's no difference in the odds of COPD over here among the smokers. What you will notice is that the odds of COPD among the smokers, irregardless of their coffee drinking, is higher than the odds of COPD uh, over here among the non-smokers. The thing is that the odds of COPD is balanced between the coffee drinkers and the non-coffee drinkers, but it's lower for both of them here among the non-smokers than among the smokers. And this was the reason that we were having confounding before. Among these smokers, the odds of COPD was higher. And because there was a higher percentage of smokers among the coffee drinkers, on average, the coffee drinkers had higher odds of COPD. It's because they had more smokers within their group. And so those smokers brought their higher odds of COPD to the group. And so we had this apparent association between coffee drinking and COPD, but in fact, it was confounding by the smoking. So this shows the method that we use to reduce, minimize, confounding in our models to allow us to see more clearly the actual relationship between the exposure and disease of interest. This method is called conditioning on a variable. What we're doing here in this example is we are conditioning on smoking. And so what it means is that we are looking at the association between coffee and COPD, our exposure and our disease within levels of another variable, the variable that we are conditioning on. So here, the levels of smoking are yes and no, either you smoke or you don't. And so we're looking at the association between coffee and COPD among smokers, that's one level, and we're looking at the association among non-smokers, that's another level.
Now, some of you might have heard of this process before under different names. Sometimes we call it controlling for confounding. We might say that we are controlling for smoking, or we might say that we are adjusting for smoking. These are all terms that mean the same thing. It's conditioning on a variable. We condition on a variable to control confounding of our primary relationship of interest by that particular variable. Now, I want to show these data in a different way uh, to introduce one other term. And so this is, uh, again, the same analysis that we just saw. The numbers are all the same, but now I'm using the two by two tables. And let's look at not only the analyses controlling for smoking or conditioned on smoking, let's also look at our original analysis. And what we can see here is that in the original analysis, we saw a relationship between coffee drinking and COPD. The odds ratio was 1.7. But when we looked within levels of smoking, when we conditioned on smoking, we found that the odds ratio within levels of smoking, both of them were equal to 1.0. Now, when the associations that you see between exposure and disease are similar within the levels of the variable on which you are conditioning, you can then combine these associations together into what we would call an adjusted association, an adjusted odds ratio in this case. So the, we found that the odds ratios were similar among smokers and non-smokers. And so we can combine those together, kind of average them together um, and call that the adjusted odds ratio. And over here, conversely, when we aren't conditioning on any variables at all, we call the odds ratio that uh, represents the association between our exposure and our disease, here coffee drinking and COPD, as the crude odds ratio. Now, sometimes the odds ratio that we find within each of the levels of the variable on which we are conditioning will not be the same. In this case, they were the same. If they're the same and similar, we can combine them into an adjusted odds ratio. But if they're very different from each other, then we have another thing happening, which is called effect modification. And we're going to be talking about that more um, in, in future videos. Um, but for now, let's just think about the case where we find that the association between the exposure and the disease here, coffee drinking and COPD, is similar within levels of the variable on which we are conditioning. Now, how do we think about this within the context of our diagram and how do we indicate it? And I know that in previous videos, I suggested that you put all of your variables into boxes. And I actually regret that now because I forgot that we actually want to use boxes in our causal diagram to indicate conditioning on a variable. So in this situation where we conditioned on smoking, what we would do is we would draw a box around smoking like this, which means that we are planning to condition on this particular variable and our other variables wouldn't have boxes. So sorry for that mistake in the earlier videos, um, but hopefully you could make that adjustment here. So if we just want to think about this, if we're conditioning on smoking, just take a look at it again. Look at our causal diagram within levels of smoking. Essentially what we're doing here is by putting this model, for example, here on the top, only among those people who are smoking, what, we're, what we are essentially doing is we are breaking this causal link from the tendency to use stimulants through smoking to COPD because we're essentially taking out all of the variability in smoking. And so there's no possibility within that subset of data for smoking to have a causal effect on COPD. And so we are essentially blocking this uh, potential for confounding. And the same thing is happening down here. So the things to remember from this video are that one is that if you're conditioning on a variable, it means that you are splitting your analysis into parts within levels of the variable on which you're conditioning. And the second thing is that we use this method to control for confounding. So this is going to be very important. Essentially, the kinds of models that we're using, these multiple linear or logistic regression models, essentially what we're doing in broad strokes is we're telling the statistical software a few things. One is, what is our exposure variable and our disease variable, our cause and our outcome? And the other thing we're telling the statistical software is, which variables do we want to condition on? And the statistical software is going to do that for us. And essentially by controlling confounding, by conditioning on the correct 
variables. What we're doing is we are eliminating, or if not eliminating, we are reducing to a great degree the probability that any associations that we see between exposure and disease are in fact not due to that third basic causal structure, which is confounding. And so once we've done that, we've sort of eliminated or minimized the potential for confounding, we're only left with the first two causal structures. The first one is our hypothesis that the exposure actually has a causal effect on the outcome. The second one is that the outcome has a causal effect on the exposure, reverse causality. Sometimes we can eliminate the possibility of reverse causality by the structure of our study design. For example, if we collected data in a way that we are absolutely certain that the exposure preceded the outcome, other times we can be less certain. In fact, with our cross-sectional data like the NHANES data, one of the limitations of collecting both the exposure information and the outcome information at the same time is that you are less certain about whether or not uh, reverse causality could be a possibility than if you had collected the data in a way that you first collected the exposure and then waited for the outcome to happen. But you can begin to see the framework here in which we are working. We have our exposure and our outcome variable that interest us, and then we're building up a diagram of our ideas about the causal structure of reality. And then we are choosing those variables that we need to condition on in order to remove confounding to the maximum degree possible in the association between our exposure and our outcome. So what you're going to be doing in this next step of building your model is putting down your ideas about the causal structure of reality and then determining which variables you need to control in your analysis to minimize confounding in the association, the pattern in the data between your primary interest, which is your exposure and your outcome. And what you're going to have to find out is whether or not the data you need, the data you need to condition, are available in the NHANES data set. If they aren't, then you're going to have to make a decision about whether or not the amount of confounding that you expect to be remaining in that association between exposure and outcome is sufficiently small that you feel comfortable going forward with your model. If you're not comfortable with the amount of confounding that's going to be there, then you're going to have to choose a different exposure and outcome to model.